Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed a day that you have made, and we rejoice in it. Lord, we thank you that you sent your only begotten Son into the world to show us how to live, show us how to walk, show us how to be obedient to you. And what does he do? He bids us to come and follow him. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would follow him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And we pray, Father, that now you would anoint my tongue to declare your word that you've given to me to give to your people today and anoint every ear and heart and mind that hears it to receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark 14, beginning at verse 22. We're not going to cover a lot of verses today, but uh, that's okay. While they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take it. This is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. We know this meal as the Lord's Supper, but every Jew knows it as Peshach, or Passover. It was first observed in Egypt on the night just before the Egyptian pharaoh let God's people go. God gave the instructions for this particular meal to Moses to give to the people of Israel. They were to prepare the meal exactly as they were instructed and eat the meal in haste because the very night they ate it, the Lord would pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, because the Lord was bringing judgment upon the gods of Egypt. But for Israel, when the Lord saw the blood of the slaughtered lambs on the doorposts of every Israelite home, he would pass over that home and not bring to that home the destructive plague, any destructive plague. The Passover was to be observed from generation to generation to generation. It was one of three feasts or holy convocations of the Lord. And the Lord's people were to celebrate it every year, those three feasts. The first Passover, though it was first observed in Egypt, eventually God ordained that the three feasts would be observed in Jerusalem. All three of these feasts were an occasion for pilgrimage to Jerusalem to be with the Lord and to meet with him. Now, though though the Gospels give us only a glimpse of the Passover meal, we know from Scripture that those who ate it that first night left Egypt without any infirmities. The whole company of Israel left Egypt whole. From Scripture, we also know that the bread of Passover was a special bread. It had no yeast in it. Yeast sometimes represents sin in scripture and sin had no place in this meal because the one who was to come the one who would be the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world would have no sin in him we also know that this special bread had stripes and piercings this matzah this Passover bread those stripes and the piercings they pointed to the stripes and the piercings God's lamb would receive prior to his sacrificial death. But we also know from scripture that it is by his stripes that we are healed. Jesus would give his flesh to the whip and the nails for our healing. All of the people of Israel came out of Egypt without any infirmity. It's a sign of what God planned to do for all. And then when Jesus came to the third cup of that meal. We have learned a little bit more about the fact that that cup was known as the cup of redemption. But how did it get that name? I don't think that we have ever looked at that particular passage. 
That teaching comes directly from Exodus 6, 6 to 7. And here's what the passage states. And this is the Lord speaking to Moses. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment, and I will take you to me for a people. And I will be for you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So the four I wills in that particular passage became the four cups of Passover. And so that God says, I will bring you out, I will deliver you, I will redeem, and I will take you to be a people for myself. That's where it comes from. Isn't that cool? Our God is so awesome. That first Passover meal was followed by quick deliverance of God's people from Egypt, but the entire meal pointed, of course, to a greater deliverance to come. God's own Passover lamb would be sacrificed. His stripes would bring healing. His blood would bring forgiveness. We know from Paul's letter to the Hebrews that there can be no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Without Jesus shedding his blood, without the application of his blood on us through our believing in him, God would not be able to pass over our sin. But with the shedding of blood, the shedding of Jesus' blood, and our applying his blood upon ourselves through faith in him, our sins are forgiven. God doesn't see them. He sees his son. He sees his son's blood covering it, covering us, and so he passes over us and does not bring upon us the destruction our sins deserve. Jesus said that his blood was poured out for many. Well, in actuality, it was poured out for everybody. It was poured out for all people of all time and all sins. Many would receive it. Many would receive it and its benefits by faith. Unfortunately, many have not and will not receive it. Such actions on their part does not negate the fact that he died for all. Because he did. Verse 25, Jesus went on to say, Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Do you think Jesus is looking forward to that day? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. With great anticipation. Verse 26, we find then, After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying the same thing. Well, last week I closed the message with a teaser. I said that it's possible that the rooster is not a rooster. I said, come on back. Did any of you go and search out the internet to find out what in the world I was talking about? Are you all just patiently waited for the day. Okay, well, anyway, uh, you know, I didn't know this, but Friday night prayer group, Cheryl and I go to, all of a sudden they were talking about the fact that it wasn't a rooster. Um, And so let me just read this to you because it's just really good. And I found this on the internet. Actually, I found a number of things on the internet about this. But here's what this particular writer had to say, and this guy here is, doesn't tell us who he is. He says, most readers, such as us, <laughs> such as us for all of our life, okay, 
assume Jesus' statement refers to a rooster crowing in the early morning hours. And Peter's actions preceded the rooster crow. It really seems straightforward, doesn't it? I mean, we know if we're anywhere near where roosters are crowing, we know they crow in the morning. So it seems clear. It seems straightforward. That is until we step into the world of ancient Judaism. And that's where we've got to go. The Mishnah, that's the earliest compilation of rabbinic oral law, states that roosters and chickens may not be raised in Jerusalem due to purity concerns. You can't have a rooster crowing if they're not raised in Jerusalem. This decree comes from the first century when the temple stood in Jerusalem when Jesus walked the earth. So, if roosters were not permitted to be raised in Jerusalem, are the Gospels wrong? No, it's just the translation and our understanding of it. The Greek term elector, which means cock, you know, the cock crow, can also mean a man or a husband. Thus one can read the Greek of the Gospels as, the man will not cry out today before you deny three times that you know me. This indicates that the Gospels did not mistakenly place a rooster in Jerusalem when roosters were not allowed to be raised in the city, but doesn't ask, answer the question. So let's move on. The ancient Jewish sources offer a solution. In describing the activities that went on in the Jerusalem temple, the Mishnah references a specific time in the early morning. And here's a quote. He that was minded to clean the altar of ashes rose up early and immersed himself before the officer came. At what time did he come? Not always at the same time. Sometimes he came at cock crow and sometimes a little sooner or later. Cock crow refers to a time in the morning when the priests began to prepare the temple for the day's events. Okay? Every day they used to remove the ashes from off the altar at cock crow or near to it, either before or after it. It does not mean a rooster crow, but rather the blast from a trumpet at the temple that announced the time. At cock crow, they blew a sustained, a quavering, and another sustained blast. In other words, cock crow refers to a time early in the morning when a trumpet signaled the beginning of the day for work at the temple. The Hebrew expression for cock crow is Karat hagever, the call of the cock. The Hebrew word gever, translated as cock, also means man, like the Greek elector. The Gospels then preserve the Jewish Hebrew manner of speaking of the trumpet blast sounded from the temple that announced to the priest it was time to begin preparing the temple for the day. Jesus did not refer to a random rooster, but ra rather to a specific time in the morning that Peter would have known about. Every single day, a priest would get up and sound the trumpet, and that was cock crow. Excavations along the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem uncovered a stone bearing a Hebrew inscription, and that inscription was this, to the place, literally, to the house of trumpeting. Scholars have suggested that this stone marked an area on the southwest corner of the Temple Mount facing toward the city where the priests would blow the trumpets announcing the different times of the day and week. Josephus is referenced. It seems reasonable that this stone marked the location from where, which cock crow sounded. The evangelists assumed, and see this is where we get into trouble, the evangelists assumed that their, re their readers understood the cultural and spiritual world of ancient Judaism. Therefore, they did not explain the language and the details. That's where we get into trouble. 
You know, when the Christian church was divorced from its Hebrew roots, we lost those idioms. So the task of the modern reader of the Gospels is to read the Gospels within the language and the culture and the spiritual world of ancient Judaism because sometimes a rooster is not a rooster. Isn't that interesting? You know, um, you know, basically that trumpet sound, since there weren't any roosters in Jerusalem, served the same purpose. So I can see it being called cock crow. <laughs> Actually, in all honesty, it, it doesn't matter because it's going to lead to the same thing. Okay? But it's still very interesting to know the little details that we didn't know before. And this referred to a man who was calling the priest to come to work for the day. That's where we are going to stop because, you know, we get into more. We just, we could go on and on and on. So, anyway, but that's where we're going to stop in knowing that I think it was really, really wonderful today because we saw, we had two pieces of revelation. The revelation from Exodus 6, 6 and 7 for the, what those four cups of Passover mean, and then what does the cock crow mean? I think, you know, God is just opening these things up to us, and I think it's wonderful. Amen and amen.